Welcome to lecture 28. So we will talk about real time communication. So distributed platforms for real time applications are becoming quite popular. So that's the reason along with making the processor real time which we have been working on. It is also important to look at the communication aspects, the network aspects such that even a distributed solution built on top of a realistic network has some real time properties. Right? Again, we are using cheap off the shelf hardware. We are using regular real time operating systems. We also need real time communication. So, traditional communication provides best effort service. On the other hand, real time communication supports some specific quality of service demands. In the sense, if a certain packet is supposed to reach within 2 milliseconds, then that should be the case, right? So some guarantees are made. So basically you are bounding the maximum permissible delay and also the maximum permissible packet loss rate. So in RT communication, once the network accepts a connection request, pretty much the network is guaranteed, guaranteeing a requ the requested service quality that at least this level of quality you are going to get regardless of the behavior of the other nodes that are a part of the network. So what do we mean by service quality? Well, uh, so it could mean multiple things in multiple situations. So it is definitely bandwidth, the maximum transmission delay, right, and the jitter. So jitter basically meaning, it could be the jitter in terms of the bandwidth, but that's typically not the case, it's the jitter in terms of latency. So if let's say we have a 5 millisecond transfer time and let's say this can increase and become 10 milliseconds, the jitter would be 5 milliseconds. So it's basically a combination of these three things, the bandwidth, the maximum possible transmission delay and let's say within that, what is the jitter, what is the uncertainty, right? And then if you would like to add one more parameter in a realistic network with queuing, that would be the packet loss rate in the sense how many packets are you allowed to drop. So again a related term is the blocking probability which means that the network is kind of is unresponsive, the network is unresponsive or appears to be unresponsive and it is not accepting any new connections. So it is basically a corollary of the rest where essentially some resource has been choked which is leading to network blocking. So what are the QoS requirements for different types or kinds of real-time communication systems? So we had classified applications into hard, soft and firm real-time systems. So it is difficult to classify communication systems on the basis of this. So the only way we can classify is basically into non real time communications and maybe soft, you know, regular hard real time uh, communications and non or soft real time communications. So in soft real time communication, which is more like becoming the norm today in many specialized networks, a very few QS parameters, quality of service parameters are important. It is by and large insensitive to the other parameters. Some examples would be, you know, regular email and web browsing and so on. So all of these come with timeouts and these timeouts have to be respected. So if you look at soft real-time communications, so then at least one thing that we want is loss-free operation, which basically means that if you consider, let's say any protocol such as FTP, file transfer, you can't even lose one byte. If you lose an if you lose a single byte, the entire thing goes. So that is why there is a need for a retransmission mechanism. So much of the complexity of traditional networks actually arises from the fact that you can drop packets, but end to end a packet drop is not allowed in the sense whatever the sender is sending, the same has to be received. And the other is along with loss free communication, you need bounds on the average packet delay and average throughput, even though these are more like soft bounds in the sense if you occasionally exceed these bounds, nothing much is going to happen. 
then some parameters are there which are not important in soft real time all the worst case parameters are not important in the sense worst case packet delay jitter or worst case throughput these are things which are not important in contrast non interactive television and let's say audio broadcasting they have very stringent requirements on the jitter especially the reason that there are very strong requirements on the jitter is basically because otherwise you know if the new frames will not come so let's say if tv is being sent at uh, 30 frames a second so you expect a new frame of data to come every 33 milliseconds so of course the latency doesn't matter in the sense you know the because we have a pipeline over here the latency doesn't matter so a single frame can even take 10 seconds to come that doesn't matter as long as the next frame after it comes 33 milliseconds later so that is the important part that is the operative part over here that the next frame comes uh, exactly uh, 33 you know not exactly but the worst case time between the two frames in this case would be 33 milliseconds so that is the stringent bound so if we look at a fly by wire aircraft so modern aircraft where you have you know the fly by wire is a concept where everything is transferred electronically and monitored by sensors and so on this is also very sensitive to the delay so this would technically allow for only sub millisecond delays in the receipt of sensor signals so this is pretty much the only thing that is acceptable to the controller so if you look at form real time applications right where occasionally you can you are allowed to drop a packet here again delay is not an issue but a packet loss rate and jitter are the major issues so the video transmission is of course sensitive to the packet loss this is not something that you know you are supposed to lose but again if you lose one or two packets it will show up as flickers or glitches in the screen which is fine it will not really break things it will be at best a minor encumbrance but that's fine voice applications will be similar to video fair let's say with jitter and increasing packet loss rate the quality of voice will degrade but again you know it will not degrade uh, very significantly if let's say one packet out of 1000 is dropped but of course at one point you will start hearing it so now there are some applications which actually require real time communication and could be hard real time so any kind of a manufacturing setup with robots right with a lot of automation would require real time communication any kind of an automated chemical factory where you are dealing with very sensitive chemicals that would internet banking for sure video conferencing and multimedia multicast and internet telephony so of course they would require real time communication to different extents but the more critical the application more is the requirement for real time message delivery so just look at these robots everything is being connected uh, to a desktop ultimately to a computer ultimately and as you can see it is very important to give commands in a very timely fashion otherwise what is being manufactured that's not going to happen very accurately so that is why uh, it is necessary to connect these at real time voip so voice over ip is basically the way that in the many of our internet telephony um, uh, works so voice over ip uh, routers they need to be designed in a special manner because regular ip routers by default handle traffic on a first come first serve basis which is not really what we need from a real time point of view so the diff serve system gives priority to voice over ip packets so in a sense you know the same way that scheduling was the main mechanism for real time processing so similarly for let's say an internet router it basically has multiple inputs and multiple outputs and each one of them has multiple queues right so essentially any kind of a switch that's the way it would look like so basically scheduling the flows from these switches uh, from these queues i'm sorry and managing these queues right buffers in the queues is basically the primary mechanism via which we 
create real time protocols. So there is a need to assign a priority to a packet such that if need be, they can jump the line and they can be transmitted ahead of other packets in the queue. So it is only, you know, such kind of mechanisms that are, again, they are very similar to scheduling in processors, which give us real time guarantees in these switches. So they, this can work well when voice is a small fraction of the overall network load as it is in today's internet. So the delay as such consists primarily of three components. Uh, so so that will basically be the propagation delay, the transmission delay, uh, the queuing delay in the routers as I have just shown. So the propagation delay is approximately 0.5 microseconds per kilometer. So it is basically the rate at which signals travel in the chosen medium, right? So this is roughly the case. So this is not much and this is constant. So this is not really affected by the real time or non real time nature of the workload. The transmission delay is the time it takes to transmit, which is basically the packet size divided by the link speed, which is nothing but the bandwidth. So in the sense, if it's a 10 megabyte packet, let's consider it's a 10 megabit and you transmit at one megabit per system. So the time it will take is 10 seconds, right? So basically this is the transmission delay, which is purely a function of the bandwidth. And this is a function of the distance basically between the sender and receiver and the late uh, and the rate at which the signal flows in the chosen medium. So the first two are not an issue, not a major issue. The biggest issue is the skewing delay, which is much larger than the other components. Because you know, when you when we have multiple flows in a router, we need to choose among them, and that is what becomes difficult. And uh, because that becomes difficult, we uh, need to have a proper packet selection algorithm at the network switches. Then there is delay jitter, which is the maximum variation in the packet delay. So typically what happens is because of queuing and so on, because of congestion in the network, the jitter increases. And also what can happen is if you have congestion in one area, a packet can take a different path, which will again, you know, take a different amount of time. So this also helps in increasing the jitter, right? So these two factors are basically jitter increasing factors. So of course, all of these, all of this jitter can be absorbed by a buffer at the receiving end, right? So a buffer at the receiving end or the re receiver end can reduce the effect of much of this delay. But again, to reduce a lot of delay, you need a very large buffer at the receiver side, which may not be practical. So the buffer size that is required to reduce the jitter can be given by the simple little slow formula uh, that you look at the peak rate. So actually, sorry, this should be the buffer size. So the peak rate is a peak packet transfer rate, right? And so basically the unit of this will be in bytes per second multiplied with the delay jitter. So the time and time will cancel. So what will remain is B and this will be the buffer size. So an example is that a video source transmits at let's say 30 frames a second. Each frame contains two megabits of data and the jitter is five seconds. So the buffer size that is required is 30 times two times five, which is 300 megabytes, which is substantial, which is not a small number. So the categories of real time traffic are three types, CBR, constant bit rate, variable bit rate and sporadic. So we'll study these in the subsequent slides. So CBR is constant bitrate traffic, which means that, you know, the number of bytes transmitted per second remains constant with respect to time. And one example of this will be the periodic data that is generated by sensors, right? So this would be one example. So these are fixed size messages which are transmitted periodically. So typically hard real time applications will generate such kind of data or require such kind of data. And it is also much easier for the network to schedule such kind of a flow. 
Then we have variable bit rate or VBR traffic. Where there are different rates of transmission, as you can see, at different times, right? So a common example of this, uh, right, uh, would be this is a common type of VBR traffic. Fair, you know, you could have transmission for some time, keeping quiet for some time, transmission keeping quiet. So something like you know a chatting kind of application, right? That would have a variable bitrate traffic. Fair, you know, there are typically pauses between the times that we chat. And then, of course, we do chatting and then we remain quiet for some time. So that would be an example of a variable bit rate. Sporadic traffic. Packets are generated in bursts, followed by long periods of si silence. So, of course, you may argue that what is the difference between sporadic and VBR? Well, sporadic is definitely variable bit rate. But again, it is a, it's an important subclass of VBR. Given the fact that it's a very important subclass, a need arose to treat sporadic as a separate traffic class. So here we have a lot of traffic followed by a long period of silence. Again, a lot of traffic, again silence, again traffic and so on. So this is a special type of VBR tra uh, traffic, but it's again, it's a special case. So given the fact that you have determined, we have discussed the kinds of traffic, let us now give some background on the kinds of networks that we are looking at. So local area networks, you know, within a department or within a you know, single building are by far the most automatic and default choice for networking as of today. So of course, you could have point to point links in the sense if you have N nodes, you could have n times n minus 1 links, right? Order n square links. Or what you could do is that, you know, it, the network could have any topology. But before sending a packet, you would basically reserve the entire route. So what does the reservation mean? It basically, reserve, it basically means reserving space in the buffers of the queues of the routers that are along the path. L let me repeat. Reserving space in the buffers in the queues of the routers that are along the path, right? So basically reserving buffer space. So once the entire space has been reserved, so, so as I have said, this buffer space in queues is basically the key target of optimizations in creating a real-time network. And scheduling the packets in these queues is as important as scheduling processes, for example, in a uniprocessor kind of system. So one approach could be that even before sending a single packet, you reserve the entire route, where we have just discussed what reservation means, and then the packets are sent. So this is known as circuit switching. This and point-to-point -point are both very inefficient and costly, not to be done. So in a circuit switch network, essentially you are reserving buffer space, you are reserving a fixed portion of the bandwidth, and once the reservation is done, you are sending a packet. If traffic is inherently bursty in nature, it's a bad idea because you are just wasting bandwidth and resources. There is a waste. And many real-time systems are bursty in nature. As a result, you'll have this waste. And as a result, this is not a good idea. Again, with point-to-point -point wiring, there could be too many segments. All right. So I'm sorry, there's a correction over here. It's n times n minus 1. The sheer complexity of wiring will be enormous. It will be quite high, right? The sheer complexity will be enormous. And the cost of wiring, the weight of wires, etc. will become a concern. So given the fact we have looked at local area networks, at least we understand the major issues and we understand that circuit switching is a bad idea. We also at the same time understand that point to point connections are a bad idea. So what you need is basically a shared medium like a bus, which will have multiple senders and multiple receivers where the same node could be a sender and a receiver as well. So one of the prominent bus-based designs is a controller area network, which is there inside a car. So a car today, an automobile, has so many components that there is a need to actually 
create a custom bespoke network for an automobile which is to create a bus and connect everything to the bus so uh, we can have a lan also within the car but that's not common we have a controller area network or a can bus and then of course we have talked about lans and lans are not in embedded environments but they are in bigger setups and then we have the large internet which consists of a large number of lans pretty much right so the name internet comes from the fact that every university or every set or every you know town city and apartment building they have their own private networks we find a way to connect them so coming to the controller area network for auto uh, for automotives it was initially created by bosch in mid 80s the goal was to reduce the amount of wiring because in automobiles wiring is expensive and basically to make the all the components talk in a common language so what would a typical car's uh, network look like you'll have multiple can buses so one will carry like the core traffic the engine right the the suspension traction right the the gearbox the dashboard airbag and so on all of them would talk to each other because you know so as you can see they are important a smaller one could be the wiper lighter blinker all connected to a gateway another smaller one could be the small switches that we have for the mirror window and lock so they could again do that and they could talk to a gateway right so basically you, know, you can have one can bus like this and as you can see this is the hub point which is starting another can bus like that but basically a can bus is like a chain where it's a single bus where multiple senders and receivers are connected and nowadays in a modern car almost everything is wired almost everything has a small processor which can receive messages send messages and so on so of course as we will see there are different kinds of bus protocols right so the top one is a can bus the bottom one is not really the can protocol even though it's also a bus it's known as a lin bus so we'll discuss the difference between can and lin but it's important to understand that any car has become so complex today with you know sensors actuators uh, senders and receivers of data everywhere that we have a lot of these you know electronic control units scattered everywhere which are connected at the high level with a can bus and at the lower level with other kinds of buses because they provide other kinds of features so almost everything is uh, wired up the engines airbags seat occupation sensors diagnostic computers radio cd player everything so a standard can bus would be a typical flat network right single bus and senders receivers connected to it you could have a hierarchical network also where any sender receiver would also kind of be like heading another bus right it would be the gateway for another bus so this could be a hierarchical design so the can bus is a standard right so the can bus is a standard you know it has two wires uh, going on you know it it requires two wires basically two parallel wires you could have other kinds of buses which are inexpensive and protocols can be implemented in software right uh, so 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 basically you know the can bus also you can implement protocols in software but as i said can bus is primarily a hardware uh, protocol right and so then of course what we do is that we have a hierarchical network and create these subnets this is an inexpensive example of increasing the reach of the bus right so of course you know no node over here would directly compete with some other node that is connected to the main bus but it will always compete among sister nodes and let's say once it wins it can send a message on the main can bus via this node so now coming to a lin bus so lin is a technology to provide a sub network to can it is something that has reduced functionality and consequently lower costs so unlike can bus which has two wires it has a single wire and also in the can bus you know you don't have a notion of a master and a slave everybody can receive messages everybody can initiate the process of sending messages and send messages also but in lin you have a single master 
right, whose job is to head the subnetwork, and almost so all the decisions are taken by the master and in many versions of lin it is the master only who can write and the rest read or the master is the only one who can read and the rest write so lin versus scan so if you look at it the top network is lin with a single wire so of course for every you know satellite is nothing but a electronic control unit that is attached to a car component it will have the physical layer support for lin and then you know subsequent layers and also the lin bus will talk to the master over here whose job is to connect to a can bus and basically affect a communication like this can buses on the other hand right uh, work differently instead of one wire they have two wires the rest is more or less the same where you have a physical interface and a link layer interface and then basically the code so lin does not support a lot of bandwidth it only supports around 20 kilobits there is a single master multiple slave you don't need any uh, arbitration and also there is a very low cost implementation based on urt uart or sci interface hardware so almost any microcontroller today as of or at least as of today can get access to a lin bus and given the fact that it is so simple it has guaranteed latency can on the other hand can be fairly long it is meant to be for la large networks right so it can be for you know cars buses and so on so that is why it can grow to as much as 50 meters so can is designed to be the primary network of a bus its propagation time is small so it's more like a local bus in a computer that's the way it behaves so if you look at automotives the automotive electronics as of today is fairly sophisticated you have uh, elaborate engine management algorithms fuel injection active suspension braking lighting everything when the engine is operational there is a considerable considerable amount of information exchange among the different components among the different electronic components of the car they actually send a lot of messages to each other so the main role of cam is to capture much of that furthermore it has to be very effective in handling noise because if you think about it automotive is electrically a very noisy environment Right, so there are a lot of components, there are a lot of mechanical components which also have, could have an electrical signature. So there is a lot of noise. So given the fact that they produce a lot of noise, again, you know, you have RF transmissions, you have the ignition systems, this is exactly the mechanical component I was talking about. Right, but it's not purely mechanical, it's mechanical come electrical. And then in electric cars, you could have motors. So there given the amount of noise it actually does make sense to have two wires right uh, to send a signal via two wires and basically you know use differential signaling basically and monitor the difference in voltages across the two wires so given the fact that the two wires are co-located noise will affect them similarly and when we subtract the voltage of one from the other most likely the noise will also go away Basics of the CAN protocol, so the basic CAN-MAC protocol is based on carrier sense multiple access. So what happens is that multiple nodes try to access the CAN bus at the same time, right? So the moment they try to do that, there will be a collision. But thankfully in CAN, there is a very easy way known as a non-destructive bitwise arbitration method to res resolve collisions and pick a winner. So the role of the winner basically here is to keep transmitting on the bus until it feels that it no longer needs to transmit. So CAN manages the MAC issues, which is the second layer. So every outgoing message is stamped with a unique identifier. And the identifier in many ways represents its priority. Right, so we will discuss how this is used 
So it's important to understand the CAN's communication model slightly, the OSI reference model of CAN. So we have the physical layer and the data link layer, which are the two lower layers of the OSI protocol. So of course, you know, to understand this, there is a need to understand the CAN protocol quite well and the OSI network stack quite well. So the CAN protocol is something that will be explained. But uh, the OSI network layer, you know, this diagram, uh, if you're not understanding this, read what is a network stack, understand the seven layer model and then, and then come back. So the CAN protocol basically runs in the first two layers, the physical layer and the data link layer. Four other layers from network transport session and presentation have a very limited, you know, straw man baseline implementation. It's a partial implementation basically using a higher layer protocol. And then at the application layer, which is to basically process the CAN messages. So that of course, you know, any electronic control unit will do, which is to process the CAN messages that is located, uh, the, you know, that's kind of there in the car. Also, what can be done is that we can have like a master processor in the car which can use different kinds of software such as can open or device net or even run its own RTOS like OSEC VDX if you would recall the chapter in which we were discussing real time operating systems to basically understand what messages are going on uh, you know on the can bus and if something is ne needed to do what needs to be done so if i come to the can frame format it would be like this we have a start of frame Right, uh, then of course we have an arbitration field which is nothing but its priority. So this field is quite important, we will discuss what it is. Right, so kindly keep this in mind. A control field, so and, and a data field. So data field is a payload and control field basically, you know, tells you what to do with the data field. Then basically an error correction field known as a CRC field. An acknowledgement, if an acknowledgement is being sent, the end of frame bytes and then some interframe space in the sense a mandatory spacing between two CAN frames. So this is pretty much what is there in the structure of a CAN packet, right? And uh, so that's how we go forward. So the most interesting thing in actually CAM buses is contention resolution, right? So this is the fun part where unlike a cellular network, where actually, you know, all parties transmit and then they realize that there is a collision, so then they back off. They back off for random amounts of time and because of that, you know, ultimately one is successful in transmitting. In this case, what happens is that the CAN bus itself computes a wired AND in the sense that if two nodes are trying to transmit, one transmits a one, other transmits a zero. What ultimately gets transmitted is a zero. So a wired AND is computed. Now let us look at the priority field, something that you know was over here, which I had asked you to kind of bear in mind. So in this case, you know, if the message ID, something that conveys the priority is like this, uh, then uh, what are you going to see, right? So what you will see is that if node A's message ID is 010 and node B's is 011, the bus will compute a wired AND Right, so that's the electronics of the bus. So 0 and 0, 0, 1 and 1, 1, 0 and 1, 0. So automatically you see that the priority that the bus is setting is a wired hand of that. And in this case, the priority is equal to node A's message ID. Hence node A will send. Let us now look at another example. Let this be 0, 1, 0. And let node B's message ID be 0, 0, 0. Uh, oops, sorry, I stand corrected. So basically this part is the priority and the rest of the part is the data, right? So basically, even if both try to transmit, right? So what we do is that we first, you know, have this collision in the priority. And then the way that the collision is resolved is that the bus com completes, uh, computes a wired AND. So you finally see that node A is one. 
So whatever was the data part of node A, that is what is get trans gets transmitted on the CAN bus. So since node A was transmitting 010010, the bus will also transmit 010010. All right. And because node B lost the arbitration, its contents are not transmitted. So as a result, even if there is contention on a CAN bus, the bandwidth is not wasted because you know you clearly know who won and then that node keeps on sending. So this is why CAN achieves a high bandwidth utilization because unlike other networks, if there is a collision, nobody really backs out. It is immediately clear who won the result of the collision. In this case, as you can see, it is node A and that is why node A's data gets transmitted. Now let's come to some basic LAN topologies. So nodes in a LAN are interconnected using five basic configurations. A bus, a tree, a star, a ring and wireless. So wireless does not have a topology as such. So in all cases, we have a network card also known as a network interface card whose job is to liaise between, let's say, the motherboard or the processor and the network, right? So it communicates with the motherboard on one side and the network on the other side, and it facilitates information exchange. So regardless of the type of computers, LAN can, tra can transfer data. So the network in the interface card, the NIC, the, ne the network card basically, it shields the LAN from the characteristics of each device in the sense regardless of whatever the device is, they all speak the same network language. So a LAN adapter, as I said, appears to be an interface between the computer and the network. So whatever is the physical layer protocol of the network, the voltages, signaling and so on, all those issues, electrical issues and networking issues are everything taken care of by the LAN card. So the CPU does not see anything. As far as it is concerned, there is a standardized interface with the network card and, and the network card will manage everything. So the network card, on the other hand, needs some access rights, needs some privileges. You can directly access the computer's main memory and do what is called a direct memory access or DMA. So it will access memory throughout, you know, through the data bus. And direct memory is, access is needed because you can't transfer data to the network card byte by byte. You indicate a region, transfer the entire thing to the NIC via direct memory access or DMA without the involvement of the CPU. So this is the main memory, this is the CPU. So without the involvement of the CPU, right, data is transferred to the NIC and even from the NIC back to the main memory. So dedicated region is set up in the main memory for such kind of transfers. So now if you look at a tree topology, well, uh, you could have, even though it's not very common these days, it used to be where you have a tree kind of setup with nodes all over on the tree. A star is a common setup where we have a single network hub, right? Could be a wired hub or a wireless hub. So this shows a wired hub where all the machines are connected centrally to the hub. A wireless uh, topology does not have a specific topology. So you can think of it as a star actually because you know everybody is connected to the wireless network router. So the workstation as such can be anywhere but it needs to be within the transmitting and receiving distance of the access point. So the most common wireless standard is IEEE 802.11. It defines various forms of wireless LAN connections, right? So basically here the key aim of this chapter is to discuss broadly the different networking components such that in subsequent lectures, we can create protocols for real-time networking. And all of these would again be, you know, limits placed on how frequently you can communicate, right? What is your total amount of traffic and what is the queue management policy and routers? So it will primarily center around that. So uh, along with the wireless topology, we can also have a ring topology where the nodes are connected in a ring kind of topology, right? 
So each node will transmit in turn and for a, for a predetermined period of time. So the packet transmission is predictable because first this node transmits, then this, then this, then this, and so on. So the ring architecture particularly right, is very popular in real-time applications because the very popular IEEE token bus architecture is actually based on a ring. A, a token ring architecture is based on a ring. Problems with the ring architecture, well, one breakdown can bring the entire network down. It's not very robust. Furthermore, many of the actual networks in actual assembly lines and other setups, right? They have a linear topology. They don't have a circular topology. So a ring in that case may not be a good fit. So if you look at the token bus, which is a bus based architecture, it includes the benefits of both bus and ring architectures. So what happens is the stations on the bus, it's still a bus, but they're logically arranged as a ring in the sense every station knows who is the station before it and after it. So logically they're arranged as a ring, right? Not physically, logically. So there is a special control frame called a token, which you need to have to be able to transmit a message, right? So that, that's where the name comes from, token bus. Once it has a token, every node typically transmits for a fixed duration and passes the token on to its neighbor. So as this slide says, after transmitting for a predetermined duration, the station passes the token to its either immediate left neighbor or immediate right neighbor. And then the moment the token gets it, if the node wants to transmit, it transmits. Otherwise, it just hands over the token to its nearest neighbor. So clearly, if any node breaks down, the protocol will break down. So, uh, you know, that is one problem. But that said and done, we will discuss in subsequent lectures that for real-time systems, this is by far the best idea, right? Uh, so basically, where the token pro kind of propagates along a ring, could be a physical ring or a logical ring. So at any time instant, only the token holder is permitted to transmit. As a result, by design, there are no collisions. So we never have two nodes trying to transmit at the same time. Now let's come to the second layer protocol, the MAC protocol. It should support adding and removing stations on the ring, creating logical rings, and also, you know, all the stations need not be on the same ring. They could be on different rings. So logical ring uh, could be something like this, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's a cycle like this where, you know, a node may not be on the ring, but that's okay. So now the point is that let's say you want to transmit and you don't have this token idea. Right, all the nodes are sharing a single channel, as is the case in a wireless network. So in that case, carrier sense multiple access is important. Where basically you try to transmit at a certain frequency. If there is a collision, then you kind of just hold. So every node has to sense the channel status. That's very important. So you sense the channel status. Only if the channel is found to be idle, you transmit. But collisions can also occur because two nodes may attempt to transmit at the same time. The larger the propagation delay of a network, the larger is the probability of collision. Right? So that part is obvious. Why is that part obvious? Well, because I'm keeping the channel busy for that long a duration. And at that point of time, maybe some other node wants to transmit. So there will be a collision. So if a collision is detected, it needs to immediately stop transmitting. So, so recall, in a CAN bus, you will never have a collision because of the way that the priorities are designed. The bus itself will become a wired AND bus. If you have, if these are the priorities, the final priority will become this, which will basically mean that this message is allowed to transmit over the network. So if a collision is detected, in a system which is not a CAN bus, where you can have a collision and by design, nothing has been done to automatically resolve collisions, we'll have to write a collision resolution protocol. So Ethernet is one such, you know, wired LAN protocol, 
which is very simple, low cost, high speed. It uses exponential backoff in the sense that it's a random backoff. You first back up, uh, you first back off in any time interval from 0 to k. If there is still a co collision any time interval from 0 to 2k, if there is still a collision any time interval between 0 to 4k and so on. So many attempts have been made to extend Ethernet to support real-time communication. So we will discuss this in subsequent lectures. And then let's look at the higher layer, the data link layer, the L2 layer. This consists of two sub-layers known as the LLC or the logical link control layer and the medium access control layer. And we have mainly been talking about this. We have not been speaking about this. So link control basically controls different features of the link and could be a wired link, could be a wireless link. But again, you know, it's this is not very material to our discussion now. So we will mainly discuss the medium access control because from a real time standpoint, what can happen is that if there are multiple transmitters, there could be a lot of collisions. As a result, there'll be a lot of delay and all of this delay is non-deterministic which means that if there is a task which is trying to send something and it's not getting access to the channel right to transmit a delay is being induced and that may cause the task to miss its deadline that is why we are much more interested and concerned about the medium access control protocol or the mac sub layer as opposed to others so you can look at the mac layer uh, the most important question is when and for how long can a node transmit? So this is determined by the access arbitration and the transmission control policies. In a sense, how do you get access to the shared channel? And once you are transmitting, for how long can you transmit? Right? So basically getting access and transmitting. So of course, there are minor issues like error correction, framing and so on. But those mainly fall into link controls. I'm not talking about them. So these policies together form the MAC protocol. So in the MAC sublayer, you need to determine which node accesses the medium next, right? And typically the MAC sublayer for a LAN is the Ethernet protocol. So Ethernet is a MAC protocol. So what we will see in subsequent chapters is that we have a lot of MAC layer protocols and these MAC layer protocols pretty much determine the real time nature of programs, who gets to transmit and for how long. And that's crucial. That's pretty much like what we were doing in the case of scheduling for processes. We are trying to do something very much similar for the network. So how does the workstation get its data onto the LAN medium? Well, the main the role of the MAC protocol is to allow you to do that. So MAC protocol has to somehow get you a, a transmittable channel which means that either you know you have a round robin protocol where workstations take turns or whatever you know there is there you need a protocol you can't get away without one and the basic categories are contention based approaches and round robin protocols so a contention based approach is basically an approach where you try to send there is a collision so we did see an example with can buses where the collision is automatically resolved in some cases, you need to manually resolve, manually meaning with an algorithm. And in some cases, as we have seen in the token ring kind of setup, one node transmits, then the other, then the other, and so on, because the token keeps on moving between them. That's a round robin protocol. So the real time guarantees of both these kind of protocols needs to be thoroughly analyzed. So this stops our lecture on real time communication. So this lecture was introductory. Right? So we still didn't discuss any serious real-time protocols. So this will gradually happen uh, in the subsequent lectures.